Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you guys. Good to have you on. I started this Periscope yesterday, but um, something was going on with Periscope that made it really difficult for uh, us to keep going. So hopefully it doesn't freeze today. I can get through this and uh, we, we move on from there. So I'm going to be doing a couple series around women's issues, women, a couple series, a couple topics, women's issues, women in leadership, preparing to be a wife, how to manage your singleness, preparing to be uh, multi-balanced. I want the men to stay on and watch because one day you're either going to be a husband to a woman or you have sisters or you have mothers and these are things that can really, really, really help you. So all the things I'm going to be sharing are in preparation for two events that are getting ready to happen on October 28th at our church. We're having the wife camp. It is also live streamed, so you can watch it from anywhere around the world. And it's four hours where I, I will be specifically dealing with the role of a wife. So we're going to be talking about emotional issues. We're going to talk about past hindrances. We're going to talk about understanding your body, understanding your emotions. We're going to talk about understanding your husband. We're going to talk about issues that women have in marriage. So wife camp is October 28th. You can register for it and watch it from anywhere. And then we have the Pioneer Girls, which is our conference where we take women from all around the world and just in release purpose, identity, cultivate their gifts, cultivate their fivefold mantle, activate the prophetic, and it's a blast. So I want you guys to come to Raleigh for that. But you came on for this specific title, Spiritual Roles of a Wife and a Mother. So this is really important. I don't know, someone's saying something about mother-in-laws. I'm not sure what that means, but... Um, um, if you're a mother of any kind, this is going to uh, apply to you. How can I connect with you to speak to you about the School of the Prophets? I'm not sure if you're talking about the School of the Prophets that we hold every year in August or one that's specific to you. If you need any booking information, you email booking at warringministriesint.org, booking at warringministriesint.org, uh, or you can email info at askdrfaith.com with your request for the School of the Prophets, and then we will send you to the booking team. All right, the first thing that every woman, whether you are married or not, whether you're a mother or not, you need to master is the ability to discern. God has anointed women with an intuition that just kind of knows things. Doctor is spelled out. It's info at askdrfaith.com, D-O-C-T-O-R, faith.com. So one of the things that God does with women is gives us a strong ability to discern. This helps you differentiate between good and evil, seasons and times, people's, people's characteristics, places. Why is discernment important for women? Why is discernment important for wives and mothers? Because God created women to be able to discern one the spiritual atmosphere of their home the heart of their children and of their husbands as well as the overall culture of what's happening around them so women are wired to create an environment of peace to create an environment um, where the presence of God is rest. Now, you may be dysfunctional in that maybe you went through things growing up. Maybe you have mother wounds or you have different things. And we're going to hit that in, when we do the wife camp um, school and the pioneer girls. Uh, but if you have a pretty normal upbringing, you should be able to have some level of intuition. And that's why women will say, oh, I knew he was cheating. I could just feel it. Or I had a dream that my son was getting in trouble. God has anointed and allowed women to have high levels of discernment. Even if you don't have the spiritual gift of discernment, there's an extra dosage that you have to discern just because you're a woman. But if you are, are going to be a wife, if you're going to be a mother, it is important that you can discern the environment of your house, the heart of your children, the heart of those that are coming near your children. We are mama bears, right? Our job is to protect our children. Our job is to protect those that we're overseeing. And if you don't have a high level of discernment, then you're going to miss signs that God is trying to show you. So you can grow in discernment. If you're like, I don't, I miss everything. I don't know when God is talking to me because discernment is just another way that God talks to you. But usually it's a knowing or an impression. You may just feel it. You may just sense it. You may just know it. Now there's a difference between being discerning and being critical because there's some people 
that can discern stuff, but instead of praying about it, you just criticize it. But the job is when you can pick up information or pick up someone's characteristic or what's going on with your life, your job is to pray about it and not just talk and gossip about it. So the, one of the roles of a, of a wife is to be able to discern the environment in her home. The, one of the roles of a mother is to be able to discern. Another one is pray. You've got to learn how to pray. One of the things I tell my singles early on is you have to master our prayer life. Some of you guys are on our marriage preparation boot camp. I probably said that like four times on Tuesday night that you need to learn how to pray. You need to learn how to communicate to God and also hear God's voice. You need to not just be able to talk to God, but also hear when God is talking to you. One of the spiritual roles of a wife and a mother is that they can pray and communicate God's heart back to him. That They can communicate their petitions and the needs of their family to the father and not only just petitions petition, but they understand warfare because there's different kinds of prayers. There's prayers of petition where you're making requests to God. There's prayers of thanksgiving when you're blessing God for what he has done. There are prayers of warfare when you are going into the kingdom of darkness and taking back what the enemy has stolen. I was working through uh, with somebody who's just gone through um, an adulterous relationship and I was telling the person that this is an opportunity to learn how to war. You know, in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your hurt, this is an opportunity to look at the, the devil in the eye and tell them, you tried it, you came after my family, but I closed the gates, I released the blood of Jesus, and a wife and a mother needs to be able to learn how to war. And because you're discerning, God shows you things before they come. This is women in general. God shows you things before they come. <laughs> and you're not going to learn this just because you're a mom now. You're not going to learn this just because you got married. You learn this when you're single. You learn this beforehand. It's not something that just falls on your head. So you need to understand warfare. You need to understand how you can uh, come up to break things off of your family, things that are trying to attack your children, things that are trying to attack your husband, the intercessors, things that are trying to attack your family. I went back and forth today. I was going to do a specific periscope on women preachers. I'll do it maybe tomorrow. Um, but one of the things that God has anointed women in ministry to have and to do is the ability to discern and the ability to guard your environment and your church. So women need to learn how to pray. The next thing is with the praying is the warring. So beyond just the war, like I said, regular praying, you need to be a warrior. Women are called to war and to stand in the gap. There are things that have been turned in history and even in scripture because women rose up and they went to war. And we're going to hit a lot of this at the Pioneer Girls Conference. The reason we call our conference the Pioneer Girls Conference is because we believe that we're in an hour where God is raising up women who are leaders, who are pioneers, who are in innovators who are creators and who are trailblazers so our job is to come alongside them and give them the tools to do that but women ha are naturally vicious when we when something comes after something that belongs to us you know that usually most women will fight back but this is so important not only for the life of your children the life of your marriage but for the life of your community so there's a specific grace on wives and mothers good you registered for vip perfect so i have a vip session Friday afternoon, which is four hours. We have about 50 women that are going to be there. I think we have 20 spots left and you guys can bring all the questions that you have. And I have four sections that I'm going to spend mentoring um, those VIP people. So that's separate from the Pioneer Girls uh, registration, but you surely can uh, be part of that. Wives are guardians of peace. That's the next thing. Wives are guardians of peace. So if God has called you to be a wife or a mother, you should be a woman of peace. When I'm um, coaching singles, one of the things that I tell them is men should be men of strength. Women should be women of peace. We are called to be able to release the peace of God in situations. Does this mean we have to be quiet and meek and not talk? No, but it means that we have to be stable in our emotions so that when our kids have a chaotic day and they're all over the place, they find refuge and they find peace in our hearts. Our husbands, when they've had a long and tough day and they come home, they find peace and refuge in our hearts. Men are called 
called to be men of strength. So men are called to be stable and they're called to be pillars of their house. So if a man is back and forth, if they're not stable in their minds, if they're not um, sensitive to the Holy Spirit and just kind of weak, they can't be a pillar of strength. Women are beacons of peace. Men are pillars of strength. So if you're going to be a wife, if you're going to be a mother, part of your job is to release the peace of God. And the way that you do that is not just by praying, is by being kind, is by being sweet. You could be a tough woman and still be sweet. I think I'm pretty intense and I don't I don't play around, but I think that I have the, the heart of Jesus, or at least I'm trying to have the heart of Jesus. So that's something that you develop. Don't be like, well, I'm just blunt. I'm just straight to the point. And you're not soft. Women were made to be soft. Men want a wife who is soft. They don't want to be dating somebody who has more muscle than them, right? There's nothing wrong with being so, uh, with being healthy and fit. I'm not talking about that. But if you are just mean, if you're cutting people off at, all the time, if you don't know how to be um, gentle, those are areas that the Lord has to work on and you have to submit to the Lord to help you with that. If God wired women to be not weak, because being soft is not being weak, but you need to be a person that people can lean into, people can find refuge into. Men are wired to pioneer, they're wired to build, and we're going to help the men in the husband huddle with this, that they're wired to uh, be very focused. And so that's why it doesn't make sense when two women come together because one, women are wired to be very emotional. So you put two emotional beings together, it's a mess. But men are wired to be stable and strong and help balance their emotions out. Yes, um, so you make sure that you're not the one who is stepping over your husband, overriding him, always have the final say. All those things are going to make it very difficult for you in marriage. The next thing that every wife or mother should be able to do is teach. You don't have to have a teaching gift, but women are called to teach. Scripture says it over and over. And we start by teaching our children the word of God. We start by teaching them the way to live life. That's why when we do mother wounds, the role of a mother is to provide, um, the role of a mother is to nurture. It's to comfort and to teach. And so people who have mother wounds usually didn't have anyone teach them. When I meet somebody who's constantly wandering around, still trying to figure out their wife, has no clear uh, life, has no clear boundaries, um, you know, just makes wrong decisions over and over. I usually can, it tells me that they didn't have a good, strong foundation in terms of their mother because mothers are wired to nurture, they're wired to teach, and they're wired to comfort. Well, that's how we're wired. But life happens and brokenness happens that can take us out of that initial wiring. So it is our job to say, Holy Spirit, I am not very nurturing. Lo my love language acts, um, touch is my last one. Like I'm not that touchy of a person. But when I started mentoring people and I started discipling people, I realized sometimes they don't need my advice. They need me to hug them. They need me to hold them. So I had to go past, okay, I'm not a touchy feely person, but I had to allow the Holy Spirit to teach me how to do that. Then he gave me a daughter whose love language is touch. Like she will rub your face and put your hair head on your lip. I mean, she is like touch, touch, touch. And I had to learn to be soft. I had to learn how to be gentle because you cannot be a mother who doesn't nurture. You will make your children either very hard or you will make them very clingy and they will cling to the wrong things. You cannot be a mother. And this is spiritual mothering too, that does not teach you, you know, people say, oh, I'm a prophet. And I say, okay, well, tell me about what you teach. Because really one of the landmarks or true marks of a prophet is that they teach other people how to hear God. They teach other people how to know their identity and how to know who God is. So don't tell me you're in this great ministry, but you are so mean to those that you're leading. You have not, you're not teaching them anything. The, all they're doing is serving you. That is not the role of a mother, a spiritual mother, or a natural mother. So we are called to teach. Each, okay? So um, nurture and comforting is the same, but we're also called to grow. And this is the last one I'm going to give you because I don't want to give away all the stuff I'm teaching at the wife camp and the stuff we'll hit on at Pioneer Girls. But women are like soil. We have soil. 
Men have seeds, women have soil, right? And so this is why it's important when you get married that the person that you marry, right, that their seeds are not rotten because even if you put them in your soil that is rich and that is good, you're going to try to grow it. Women are going to try everything to make any situation work. They're going to take somebody with little potential who's crazy and they have this supernatural faith to try and make it work because we have soil in us to make things grow. But if God brings you somebody who is full of wisdom and insight and loves Jesus and he has purpose and vision and plants it in your in you, you can now grow something. The other thing is, even though the man carries the seed, he needs to be able to toil your ground. What does that mean? You need to be a, around somebody. Your husband needs to be somebody who can cultivate and who can raise up and who can identify things in you that are not of God, that will prohibit things from growing. Uh, uh, he can help grow or fertilize the areas where maybe you're insecure or maybe you're afraid and, and help those things grow. So if you have good soil and good seed, then you will have good fruit. And those are your children and those are your ministries and those are your businesses when you come together. So it is really, really important that one, you nurture your own soil. Before you get married, nurture your own soil. Make sure that the fruit of the spirit is flowing out of your life. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. For those of you guys who are single, those are the things that attract men to women. When a woman is confident but not not boisterous, when a woman has self-control, when a woman is has a beautiful smile, when a woman is full of joy, it, it's not about looks. People will say, well, how come, you know, Kevin Hart cheated on his beautiful wife? It has nothing to do with looks. It, uh, uh, You know, people will say, oh, how come that ugly girl got married before I did, right? Well, she was kind. She's really sweet. She has a beautiful smile. She really loves God. And that's what men are looking for. So don't spend all this money on your outward appearance, which you guys know I do. I change my hair every three weeks. So don't look crazy either. But when it comes down to it, a good man is looking for good soil to plant his seed in. A good man is looking for good soil to plant his seed in. But sometimes we marry men who don't even know they have seed or they're spilling the seed all over town. They do not understand the value of what they're carrying. And we're just so excited to like us. And you guys do not birth anything that is worth anything. So you need to make sure too that as you have tendered to yourself and you are good soil, that you make sure that you connect with good seed. Or you're going to spend all your life. These are people that are in marriages that are fighting to get the person to come to church. They're fighting to go on a date night. They're fighting just to come together on the same page. So it's really, really important that your soil be ready, but you also have that wisdom. All right. I'll take one or two questions. I have a 1230 appointment, so I won't be able to take too many questions. But I want to encourage you guys to sign up for the wife camp. Um, you can watch it from anywhere. Um, so how do you fix the dusty broke seed, though? <laughs> well, the, the person needs to want to be fixed. The person needs to be able to see that something is wrong and that they need to work on it. And that's, I mean, with anything, especially marriage, there has to be agreement. If you think something is wrong and they don't think anything is wrong, sometimes I've counseled couples, I realize that the wife just has high expectations. The wife is really controlling. Um, the wife doesn't know how to see the, the good things that the husband is doing. So all they can pick out are the things they are wrong. So you'd have to evaluate your relationship. Because it's not always the man's fault. Sometimes there's ways that we are speaking to them. There are ways that we're conducting ourselves. There are ways that we're demanding things. And that's why we created Wife Camp to help the wives out. Um, that causes the seed to go dormant. That causes a, a man to shut down. Especially when you say no to sex every other day, right? Um, I'll teach on that some other day. But we hit it during Wife Camp. You, you can cause him to not be able to... Um, to be able to move forward and to be able to grow. So you need to look at the whole situation. How important is having domestic skills? Should we work on that more if you need to work on it? I think that you need to work on it. But when you get married, you look at the skills of, of you guys as a couple, right? I, my husband and I, when we were date, when we were courting, we said we believed in traditional roles. And it made sense for us because I love to cook. I love to decorate. I love to make a beautiful home for my family. He loves to fix things. He loves to 
to work. He loves to get his hands dirty. When is the next wife camp? The wife camp is October 28th this year. Um, it's only $95 for now. The price is going up in about a week, so you can still register. So we discussed our traditional roles, and that's what we took on. But if you get married and your husband really, really loves to clean and you really love to cook, then that's how you guys work. Uh, but I've had husbands... Husbands want to be taken care of. Husbands want to be pampered. Even if they love to clean. Even if they love to cook. Don't just be like, that's your job. I'm not going to do nothing. No. You need to make sure that you create moments where even if you're not the best cook, you try. He's going to love the fact that you try. Don't just be like, I burn everything. Go to a cooking school. Take, watch some videos on YouTube, right? So if you're single, begin to prepare for those things. And when you get married, you guys can discuss the roles that you guys have. And then you work there. What if there's a Jezebel and Ahab spirit in mother-in-law and son? Well, you've got a lot of praying to do. I mean, there's not much to do except pray that the Lord breaks it. That spirit was there before you married them. I'm pretty sure. It didn't just happen after you married them. So it's a decision that you made and now you just have to pray that God breaks it. What about a husband that doesn't do anything but wants to be taken care of? Once again, he probably didn't want to do anything before you married him. Men don't just change overnight. So now you have to deal with the consequences of your decisions. But you also need to watch how much nagging you're doing. Because sometimes when men don't move the, as fast as we want them to or when we want them to, then we keep asking the same thing over and over and over and then they just stop. They don't do it at all. So you may also need to look at your um, the way that you are doing it. And I get on the women. Like, I, I get on the women. We get on the men, too, when we do the husband huddle. But sometimes I, I re we realize that it's just because we want things a certain way. How can a single woman in the church attract men that are in the church? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Love Jesus. Serve. Take care of yourself. Be kind. Smile. How can I prepare to submit to my future husband? I have a whole blog on it, but I, I can teach on it at some other point. But you can basics is submit to leadership. Make sure that you have people that are over you. Make sure that you're not combative. Make sure that you don't always have the last word. Make sure that you have a clear vision because in marriage... Marriage is co-submission. So the husband, it will come under you and gird up the gift and the purpose and the calling that you have. And you will come under him and you will gird up and carry the calling and the ministry that he has. Scripture says to submit one to another. So the first thing in learning how to submit is learning that you could do it outside of a husband. If you have a hard time with leadership or your boss or other people or being corrected, then you're going to have a hard time with your husband. Ultimately, the husband has the final say, but that doesn't mean the mar the wife can't give um, their input. In a healthy marriage, the wife says, babe, I think we should do it this way. The husband may say, you know what? You're right. Let's do it. If he's smart, um, if it, well, even if he's smart, my husband sometimes will say, babe, nope, that's not the way we're going to do it. And he's right. And it's the, and I say, you're right. Let, we're not going to do it that way. But there is a cold submission. You submit one to another. I hate these stupid myths that go out that like the wife is always right. You know, we believe the stupid things. The wife is not always right. Um, and, and the husband uh, is not always right, but he also has the final say. And so if he makes a decision that is opposite to your decision, that is not for you to fight him over. That's for you to pray about. And, and he will learn over time that the Lord is going to hold him responsible for his decisions. But if you don't marry a leader from the beginning, a man who understands his role, and that's why we have the husband huddle. Um, that's November 4th. If that man doesn't understand his role and what he carries, that's going to be an issue too. My husband doesn't have male friends. How can I help him cultivate relationships? You may want to find out why. You may He may have had bad relationships with other males. I wouldn't force it, but you guys can do some double dates um, and see if, you know, they, he gets along with other people. But you can't make him have friends, but you can figure out what the issue is. I'm the one with the high sex drive, and my husband is just not interested in sex, not sick, or on porn advice. If he's not interested in sex, there's something that's going on. So either something is going on physically or something is going on emotionally or he's highly stressed out. Maybe he's working a lot. Maybe he's trying to provide for the family. And that's stuff that we deal with in, in wife camp and in the husband huddle. But if someone doesn't want to have sex, there's an emotional or a spiritual or psychological root that's going on there. Now, there's also seasons in marriage where someone may want to have sex more than the other. Yes, wife camp is being streamed abroad. 
God. You'll be able to watch it from anywhere in the world. Um, but you need to discern the seasons that you're in. And if your husband does not, okay, that's my 1230. If your husband does not want to have sex, you need to figure out what's going on with him emotionally, psychologically, um, or physically and meet him there. Don't bother him about the sex, bother him about his heart. What's going on? How can I help? Um, maybe he's feeling insecure about certain areas. That's what you guys need to talk through. Usually, um, a bad sex life is connected to a bad marriage is connected to a bad emotional and psychological connections. How can we curve the stress in a healthier way? Is it in the marriage? You, you guys need to figure out how to take each other's loads, how to help each other, how to be able to um, come along with the other person. All right. I've given you guys a lot of stuff. My 1230 is calling in, so I've got to go. But make sure that you register for Wife Camp. Make sure that you register for Pioneer Girls. And we will see you soon. I will jump back on. I'll do a lot of stuff on women in leadership, how to submit to your husband, and so much stuff in the next several days. All right. Bye-bye. Good. I'm glad it was helpful for you. Talk to you later. Bye.